The content of this video is for educational purposes. Any decision to revise one's clinical practice is the sole responsibility of the individual clinician. Graham Round's presentation on perioperative ketamine. And we're going to be spending the next hour or so just under that trying to answer the question once and for all, is ketamine helpful, harmful, or just a whole bunch of hogwash? And our investigation will begin with a short journey through the drug's colorful history and one-of-a-kind pharmacology. We will then critically examine the literature to find out A, is it effective, and B, how limiting are the side effects. We will also explore some new evidence that sheds some light and ultimately challenges some of our long-held beliefs surrounding ketamine. And lastly, we will discuss a new trial that may address some of our unanswered questions. So buckle up and chug your coffee because we're about to take a trip. And yes, that pun was fully intended into the past. Our story begins in Detroit, Michigan at the Park Davis Laboratory, which is now actually part of modern day Pfizer. And researchers at this lab have what I would call an eccentric history of pioneering on the edge. So in 1900, they had success inventing adrenaline, which is still sold as epinephrine today. And before the criminalization of cocaine, they made a variety of products from cocaine cigarettes to cocaine injectables that actually came with the needle in this cute little package and promised the user that it would, quote, make the coward brave, the silent eloquent, and render the suffering insensitive to pain. Later on, the lab began researching compounds related to peyote, which is a powerful hallucinogenic cactus. And so perhaps it naturally follows that in the 1950s, chemists at this lab invented fencyclidine, also known as PCP or angel dust, in their quest to discover an ideal anesthetic agent. They quickly became enamored with its unique pharmacology and noted that it produced a state of cataplexy and drunkenness in a variety of animals from pigeons to monkeys. The first published case series of PCP in humans was published in our very own Anesthesia and Analgesia uh, from a group from Wayne State University in 1958. 64 patients who presented for a variety of different surgeries were chosen completely at random. And please note there's no mention of an IRB process or a consent process for this study as 1958 does predate the Belmont report and subsequent standards by almost 20 years. So anesthesiologists started an IV and slowly administered PCP, incrementally increasing the dose and reported what happened. They placed a brachial art line, recorded hemodynamic changes, and since the patients actually maintained spontaneous respirations, they had a spirometer to measure their lung volumes. Unfortunately, authors did note that one patient aspirated. Um, and additionally, they had an EEG to record the brainwave activity. In summary, the PCP compound was almost a success. It did produce profound am amnesia with no participants recalling any of the intraoperative events. And the analgesia was sufficient enough for major abdominal surgery. When one patient did complain of pain, it was actually because the surgeon was leaning on his chest rather than the operation himself, rather than the operation itself, and the patient simply asked him to get off his chest. Additionally, the investigators concluded that the compound was incredibly stable from a cardiorespiratory standpoint, which provided a huge advantage over the current anesthetics at the time. However, there was a teensy little downside in about 15% of patients. The authors ultimately concluded that agitation was severe and therefore recommended against routine use of PCP in patients, noting that some patients were unmanageable in the postoperative period and exhibited severe degrees of manic behavior. Now, I highly encourage you to go back and look at this study. It was quite a lot of fun to read both the results and discussion sections. Um, as these poor authors tried in the most professional manner possible 
to objectively describe the absolute chaos that ensued in their PACU. And thus the chemists went back to the drawing board, formulating derivatives of PCP in search for the perfect anesthetic compound. In 1962, they successfully developed CI581 and at only one tenth the potency of its parent compound, PCP, it showed the promise of being shorter acting with less mania. And because it was a ketone, together with an amine, it was thus named ketamine. Two years later, Dr. Corson, who was an anesthesiologist from the University of Michigan, partnered with researchers from the Park Davis Laboratory to perform the first human administration of ketamine to 20 volunteers from a local state prison. Similar to results of the PCP study, they again saw profound analgesia with hemodynamic and respiratory stability. And while some prisoners did describe feelings that were abnormal, like floating in space and that sort of thing, it seemed to be much better tolerated than the previous debacle. Moreover, the key was that it didn't last long. So the authors actually remarked that the subjects were back to playing cards and playing pool about one to two hours later. Now there was considerable, considerable debate between the authors about how to best present their data to the scientific community at large. They went back and forth about how to describe it because they wanted to be careful about avoiding any negative terminology such as schizophrenic an anesthesia, for example because they were afraid that any negative connotation would prevent support of future studies. And fortunately, the first author, Dr. Domino, was talking about this dilemma with his wife, who upon hearing him describe the subjects as being disconnected from their environment, she suggested the terminology dissociative anesthetic, and thus the term was coined. Ketamine is a fascinating drug offering distinct advantages over others, and to fully appreciate its benefits, we must first understand how it exerts its effects. At the risk of offending Dr. Blair, we can simplify the brain into both excitatory and inhibitory states. Glutamate is the primary excitatory neurotransmitter of the brain. Glutamate binds to three different classes of receptors, the NMDA, AMPA, and the kinate receptors. And the binding of glutamate to any one of these three is going to cause a similar reaction. Ultimately, the receptor channel opens and it allows positive sodium or calcium ions to flow through, which makes it more positive intracellularly and thus stimulates an action potential. But the NMDA receptor itself differs from the other two in a couple unique ways. First, it requires the binding of two glutamates on either side to be activated. At rest, the channel is blocked by magnesium in its pore, which is reflected by that tiny little orange molecule in the center of the channel. And the NMDA receptor is located and concentrated on nearly every cell within the central nervous system. And in particular, areas that are um, frequently associated with pain reception, such as the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, for example. And it's this NMDA receptor where ketamine binds, ultimately blocking the excitatory response and thus no action potential. And this is where ketamine has a distinct advantage over other analgesics because it's able to prevent the repeated excitatory stimulation and the wind up phenomenon you get with the inner neurons that is associated with hyperalgesia and chronic pain. But wait, there's more. Ketamine is not limited to action at the NMDA receptor. Ketamine has so many more actions that we don't give it credit for. And while its main mechanism of action is antagonism of the NMDA receptor, this is not a one trick pony. Ketamine also has direct activity at the mu, kappa, and delta opioid receptors. Interestingly, naloxone does not reverse the analgesic efficacy of ketamine, and that suggests that the activation of the opioid receptor is not solely responsible for its analgesic properties. And much like an MAOI, ketamine also prevents the reuptake of serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, and this contributes to its efficacy against both depression and explains its hyperadrenergic properties. Now, the hypersalivation that you get or you associate with ketamine may falsely lead you to believe it's procholinergic. 
In fact, it's actually anticholinergic in nature. Uh, wait a minute. You must be thinking, um, Brittany, there is no way that ketamine is anticholinergic. If so, then why do all my patients look like this with drool and foaming at the mouth? Well, as it turns out, the salivary glands have both parasympathetic and sympathetic innervation. And while primarily a parasympathetic input that produces the volume of your saliva, the sympathetic system is responsible for changing the consistency and the quality of your saliva. So sympathetic stimulation of the sublingual and the submandibular glands specifically results in production of a much more viscous, kind of frothy sort of saliva. Ew, gross, I'm gonna gag. Anyway, um, that is why glycopyrrolate and atropine have not been shown to be effective at reducing the hypersalivation of ketamine. Instead, because that is stimulated by ketamine's adrenergic activity, it requires adrenergic blockers, such as prazosin and propranolol, and both of these have been shown to be effective in animal models. Isn't that fascinating? Fun fact for the day. All right, back to our receptors. So we were talking about how ketamine is actually anticholinergic in nature through its antagonism of the ACH receptors. And this is why you get your bronchodilation, your pupil dilation, tachycardia, and other sympathetic effects. Additionally, these anticholinergic properties within the central nervous system are partly responsible for ketamine's hypnotic effects. So remember, acetylcholine in the brain is critically important for consciousness, awareness, arousal, and thus, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors like physostigmine have been shown to reverse the hypnotic effects of ketamine. Additionally, the inhibition of calcium channels is responsible for ketamine's negative cardiac ionotropy, as well as the um, smooth muscle relaxation in the airways. And lastly, at very high concentrations, ketamine possesses local anesthetic properties through its inhibition of sodium channels in neural tissue. Um, and if you're interested in this, there's plenty of studies um, that look at the use of ketamine in epidurals and nerve blocks. So in summary, the pharmacology of ketamine is wonderfully complex and offers some unique benefits over other traditional analgesics. And as we're going to examine ketamine's efficacy in the perioperative setting, we have to consider it in light of the full picture and the various ways it interacts with our physiology. So now that we understand the variable mechanisms through which ketamine could exert its effect, let's look at the evidence. Does it work? And what about its side effects? Over the next few minutes, I am going to show you a variety of studies that each have a different focus. While some focus on pain scores, others focus on opioid consumption, and ideally we would want a decrease in both these areas. However, I think that we can all agree that barring any increase in side effects, an improvement in either one of these areas would be considered a win. So for example, if you add ketamine to an analgesic regimen that results in less pain, despite using the same amount of opioids as the control, that would be a win. And knowing that opioids have negative side effects on recovery, if the addition of ketamine allowed for a reduction in opioids without increasing your pain, that would also be a win. So now that we have the big picture in mind, let's take a look at the specifics. There are literally hundreds of studies with conflicting data on ketamine. So in the spirit of time and the promotion of highest level of evidence, we are gonna focus on the results of three systematic review and meta-analyses. The first was performed in 2011. And until this time, the effects of ketamine were really difficult to generalize due to a wide variety of heterogeneity among the trials. So authors in this review looked at the existing literature and performed a meta-analysis that was specific to isolate out only the intravenous route of administration. To be included for analysis, the studies had to be randomized, placebo-controlled, double-blinded, and measured either opioid consumption or pain severity as a primary outcome. All types of surgery were fair game, but studies using any form of regional anesthesia were excluded. And this is important to keep in mind as we review the results. The primary outcome of interest was total opioid consumption, but authors were also interested in ketamine's effect on duration of analgesia, quality of pain, side effects, et cetera. And I don't wanna to spend 
too much time on statistics, but before we look at the results, you have to understand the variable as the authors reported it. So authors used something called the standard difference in the mean, and that allows you to compare the results of studies that use different scales to measure the same variable. What do I mean by that? Um, well, well, you know, maybe for one study, um, they looked at pain using the McGill scale, another used visual analog score, one through 10, another used Likert scale, et cetera. And so the SDM allows you to actually pull that together and make a comparison between them. And interpretation of the SDM is kind of difficult to judge because it's reporting it in terms of standard deviations rather than the absolute values. So please do not misinterpret this to be like a relative risk or risk ratio. And Dr. Donahue, I do apologize in advance, but for us poor little simpletons in stats, a good accepted rule of thumb is that if the SDM is greater than 0.6 in either direction, like positive or negative, um, it's highly significant and therefore likely clinically relevant. So with that in mind, let's take a look at the results. Compared to placebo, ketamine did in fact have a large effect on the reduction of opioid consumption. As you see, the SDM is more than 0.6 in the negative or reduction direction. And this finding was consistent when sub-analyzed for timing, duration of administration, dose, type of opioid, et cetera. However, the greatest effect was seen when it was thoracic, upper abdominal, and orthopedic surgery specifically, where the SDM was over negative one. Ketamine also greatly increased the duration of analgesia by prolonging the time to the first request of an analgesic. In terms of quality of analgesia, they did see a similar pattern to the opioid consumption. So although it did overall have a significant impact on pain scores, the greatest effect was seen when it was a painful surgery associated with pain ratings equivalent to like a seven out of 10. So if the max pain score or the average max pain score was four or less, like maybe a minor surgery, ketamine's analgesic efficacy was not clinically significant. Overall, authors summarized the data by stating that nearly 80% 80, 80 of placebo groups reported a worse quality of pain despite consuming more opioids. Lastly, authors did report a significant decrease in PONV. And as this is a categorical variable, yes or no, overall, um, PONV was reduced 17%. However, if you separate out only the positive studies where ketamine did reduce opioid consumption, this difference was magnified to a reduction of 35%. And this suggests that the mechanism of reduced nausea is in part related to a reduction of overall opioid consumption. So to summarize, ketamine is effective for improving the quality of analgesia and reducing opioid requirements and thus has a secondary benefit of preventing PONV, but ketamine's effects are likely only, only beneficial for more painful procedures, such as thoracic, abdominal, and ortho. All right, a few years later, a group from the University of Pittsburgh published a review article to summarize the literature and perform an updated meta-analysis. But this time, studies with regional anesthesia were not excluded. And although they were able to include more studies, the average number of participants per treatment arm was still very low, around 50 or so. And despite this barrier, authors hoped to be able to perform a sub-analysis to look at the difference in outcomes between giving a single bolus of ketamine versus, you know, giving an infusion followed by a bolus or a bolus followed by infusion or just starting an infusion postoperatively. So in total, they identified 39 randomized control trials and five meta-analyses. However, the meta-analyses included varying routes of administration like sub-Q and IM, and so the authors had to pull out individually an additional 23 relevant RCTs looking at intravenous use. So let's start by looking at their review of the um, 23 studies from the meta-analyses. Overall, there was a consistent theme of reducing median opioid consumption by around 30 to 50%. And from a quality perspective, pain scores were also reduced, but with a wide range of degrees. In terms of grouping data from the RCTs, there was a reduction in opioid consumption by an average of 40%, which 
corroborates the findings of the meta-analyses above. And while there was a trend between increasing doses of ketamine and the magnitude of opioid reduction, a clear dose-related effect could not be drawn. Authors suggest that pain scores were more difficult to interpret because the majority of these studies were not powered for pain score analysis, and the pain scores in these studies tended to be low to begin with, a median pain score of only four. Why might that be? Well, because the pain regimens in these studies mostly included PCAs. And if you gave me a PCA while in pain, I'd probably hit the button to get myself down to four two. So in the end, authors concluded that perioperative ketamine can decrease pain scores, but the amplitude of that effect is really unclear. Now regarding boluses versus infusion, Subgroup analysis showed that while both can be effective to reduce opioid consumption and pain scores, only continuous infusions that were given postoperatively or continued postoperatively provided a long-term effect on residual pain. Why might that be? A compelling argument can be made that the prevention of central sensitization is a key component to the efficacy of ketamine. Additionally, Ketamine also has been shown to have anti-inflammatory benefits. So studies have shown that ketamine reduces the levels of inflammatory cytokines and interleukins in the surgical period. Unlike other anti-inflammatories, ketamine is unique in that it actually preserves the ability to mount a local response, such as preserving pathogen er eradication and maintaining the function of your macrophages. Alternatively, its main effect is actually blunting of a widespread systemic response. And this prompted some authors to suggest that we recategorize it from being anti-inflammatory to anti-pro-inflammatory. So in summary, ketamine packs a one, two punch by fighting pain directly at the receptor level and indirectly through its anti-pro-inflammatory benefits. And to take advantage of both of these two mechanisms, the plasma and CNS tissue levels should be maintained throughout the period of noxious stimulation. And this includes not only incision, but also the recovery period in which patients will experience these acute spikes in pain as they start to mobilize. Okay, so back to our uh, meta-analysis. Now, when the author strata stratified for surgical type, again, similar to prior literature, authors also found there was better efficacy for certain types of surgeries, such as abdominal and joint procedures. Interestingly, they went back and looked at the few studies that reported a negative result for ketamine, meaning they went back and looked at the studies that didn't show any benefit at all. Um, and they noted that these studies happen to include multimodal analgesia in epidurals. Hmm. Keep that in mind. We'll address that later. Now, what was absolutely apparent from this review is the safety of perioperative ketamine and that it is overwhelmingly well tolerated. Four out of the five meta-analyses concluded that ketamine did not increase side effects. And for the one review that did show a signal, it reported minor psychomimetic effects in the ketamine group that were short-term and spontaneously resolved. All reviews were in agreement. Sedation did not increase and PONV decreased. Now the supplemental RCTs corroborated the safety profile, even when you separated it out by administration. So all 11 of the bolus only studies reported either no or similar side effects compared compared to placebo. When you added an infusion, which ended at various endpoints, 24, 48 hours, the vast majority also showed no difference in hallucinations and sedation. Furthermore, there were two studies looked at post-op infusions that you started on the patient as they woke up in PACU. Again, similarly safe. So let's go back to these points about ketamine being more effective for opioid reduction when the pain is, ex sorry, when the pain is more severe um, and when the patient is using a PCA. Well, by 2018, ERAS and multimodal are in full swing and there are plenty more studies involving perioperative ketamine to review. So as you might expect, the signal of ketamine's efficacy on opioid reduction is reduced.
And that is exactly what we see in this Cochrane review in 2018. This review included randomized double-blinded RCTs comparing IV ketamine to placebo or to a multimodal basic analgesic regimen. All types of surgeries under general anesthesia were included. Importantly, they reported that the average dosing regimens were fairly consistent to what we use here at Vanderbilt, boluses between half to a mg per kg, and starting an infusion that ranged from two to five mics per kg per minute. The primary outcomes were opioid consumption and pain intensity at 24 and 48 hours. There were also a variety of secondary outcomes, which included side effects, hyperalgesia, time to first opioid request, et cetera. The authors were able to identify 130 trials encompassing over 8,000 participants. The risk of bias was generally very low, except for study size, where again, most of the studies have less than 50 people per treatment arm. Opioid reduction was significantly reduced by 19% at 24 and 48 hours, respectively. Of note, that only translates to a reduction of about 8 and 13 PO equivalents of morphine. Now, while statistically significant, this may not hold clinical relevance. However, just like the previous studies before, subgroup analysis showed almost a, a, a much better reduction, almost twice the reduction, when you are looking at opioid reduction for abdominal, thoracic, and orthopedic procedures specifically. And despite using less opioid, patients did report a reduction in their pain scores. However, again, in the majority of these cases, the median pain score for the placebo arms was about four out of 10. So consistent with what we've discussed so far, sub-analysis showed a much better benefit for more painful procedures where the median pain scores were greater than four. Now, before you throw the baby away with the bathwater, allow me to introduce another perspective to think about. Um, literature shows that people who are in moderate to severe pain generally will find a reduction to a three out of 10 as an acceptable outcome. Furthermore, people with pain scores below three out of 10 consider their experience or rate their experience as very good or excellent. And because this little tiny or modest decrease in pain scores with ketamine, although it was mild, did bring the median pain score down to a three, in that circumstance, perhaps it could be argued that ketamine's effects maybe are clinically relevant for patient satisfaction. Ketamine also increased the time to first analgesic request by almost an hour, which I'm not sure is you know, clinically relevant. Um, I thought the hyperalgesia component was kind of neat. There were seven studies that used these little microfilament tools to poke around the surgical incision and map out pain. Um, ketamine reduced the area of hyperalgesia around the incision by seven centimeters squared, which was almost a 50% reduction in surface area. But with only seven trials reporting this outcome, the quality of evidence was rated as low. Now concerning side effects, the overall incidence of hallucinations, nightmares, and visual disturbances was very low with half of these studies reporting absolutely none in either the treatment arm or, pl or the placebo. But if you do combine all studies, there was no observed difference between a four and 5% incidence. And importantly, if you isolate out the studies that reported at least one CNS event occurring in either arm, again, no difference between placebo and ketamine arms with the confidence interval crossing one. Interestingly, the authors also looked at studies where a benzodiazepine was used preemptively in hopes to decrease any CNS effects. And at a 5.2 versus 5.6 incidence, again, no significant difference. So what can you take away from this? I don't know, maybe about one in 20 of your patients are gonna be a little crazy after surgery, no matter what you do. I don't know. Um, in terms of nausea, this Cochrane review also confirmed earlier studies that showed a reduction in PONV with a calculated number needed to treat of 24. And to give you a comparison, the number needed to treat for Zofran is seven. So taken all together, what does this mean for us? Well, we can definitively say yes, ketamine will decrease opioid consumption after surgery. However, it's probably only really effective for painful surgeries where people are actually utilizing opioids. 
Now, a caveat to this might be to consider its use for minor procedures if the patient is at high risk for opioid-related side effects, like maybe they have severe sleep apnea. Um, and we don't have time to go into it now, but there's even stronger evidence for the ep efficacy of opioid-tolerant people undergoing surgery, as the opioid sparing effect is almost double. Additionally, there is a unclear benefit on how much ketamine can reduce opioids in the setting of ERAS, where opioid consumption is already relatively low to begin with due to multimodal and regional anesthesia. Lastly, the reduction in opioid requirements is likely a part of the mechanism for decreased PONB. Point two, the evidence is clear. Despite your preconceived bias, ketamine does not increase CNS side effects. Now, hopefully I have not put you to sleep, but to be fair, I am an anesthesiologist, so it's kind of my job. But to wake you up a little bit, here is your CME code. For those listening, it is 40093. And while you take the time to enter into your code, allow me to entertain you with this little gem I came across on an online reference as I was preparing for this presentation, suggesting that one use of ketamine can be particularly useful when your penis is entrapped in your zipper. Now that I have your attention again, let us continue. All right, I'm gonna ruffle your feathers a little bit and I'm gonna challenge some traditional dogma. Some of you are out there thinking, no, I hate ketamine. It prolongs my wake up, it's terrible. Well, let's take a look. I have scoured the literature in PubMed to explore this very issue. Folks, I have identified one single reference, a case report from the Journal of Medical Case Reports. And it wasn't about ketamine specifically prolonging the emergence, but the authors postulated that maybe an interaction between gabapentin and ketamine provided the uh, prolonged recovery but they also failed to provide a mechanism for that in their discussion. That being said, I will take this opportunity to remind all of us that the context sensitive halftime of ketamine is similar to that of propofol infusions. And so you must consider that and account for that when planning your emergence. So does it prolong emergence? I don't know, but since there's nothing out there, this could be your opportunity to publish on it. Okay, fine. What about delirium, especially in the elderly population? To that, I'd say go back and review our slides, looking at the summary data for CNS effects of ketamine. But alas, let's look at delirium specifically. Pain, its treatment with opioids, inflammation, and neuronal damage are all contributors to delirium. Mechanistically, ketamine prevents each one of these. We know it treats pain. We know it reduces opioid consumption. We talked about it being anti-inflammatory and it does have neural protective benefits at sub anesthetic doses by preventing um, calcium mediated cell death and it promotes neuronal growth. So let's look at the evidence. In 2017, The Lancet published the podcast trial that randomized patients over 60 years of age to placebo, low dose ketamine, or high dose ketamine at the induction of general anesthesia. Patients were evaluated twice daily with a CAM ICU screening on post op day one through three. And there was no incidence or no difference in the incidence of delirium in any group. A recent systematic review and meta analysis pooled data from six RCTs using IV ketamine perioperatively, where the primary outcome was delirium. Consistent with the results of literature over the past decade, the incidence of postoperative delirium did not differ between the groups. Additionally, there may even be a protective benefit of ketamine to lower your risk of neurocognitive disorders, which is formerly known as POCD, after surgery. Combined results of three RCTs showed a 65% reduction in the risk of developing cognitive decline. So in summary, the association between ketamine and delirium is likely false. Last but not least, 
We have all been warned to avoid ketamine for patients with PTSD or suicidal ideation. Well, in 2008, a surprising study came on the scene and it challenged our aversion to ketamine in PTSD populations. Hypothesizing and knowing that ketamine had psychomimetic effects, researchers decided to explore that if patients received ketamine in a period surrounding their traumatic event, they might be at increased risk of developing PTSD. So they looked at soldiers from Operation Iraqi Freedom who received thermal burn injuries, which were severe enough to require treatment, and then later subsequently developed PTSD from the event. Researchers reviewed the anesthetic records and to their absolute surprise, found that ketamine administration was associated with a much lower rate of developing PTSD. And even more impressive, was that the PTSD rate was lower despite soldiers receiving ketamine having larger and more severe burns. Hmm. Well, as this new concept sort of gained traction, a group from Mount Sinai performed the first prospective RCT on volunteers with severe PTSD. They performed a randomized double-blinded crossover study to test a single dose of ketamine versus an active control midazolam. And patients received their first injection, either versed or ketamine, and they were evaluated at the two week mark for the severity of their symptoms. So at the two week mark, if their symptoms were still severe, they went ahead and gave the alternative injection that they did not receive the first time. Please note that six, six patients did so well that they didn't qualify for additional treatment. Of note, they all received ketamine. In the end, researchers found that ketamine was associated with a more significant reduction in PTSD symptom severity compared to an active uh, controlled midazolam. This reduction was great, or this reduction was evident in both the first period and in the crossover analysis. And as an aside, patients who also have depression saw a benefit in this area. So stay tuned, this could be a future treatment for PTSD. And we have reviewed a variety of evidence today, but still more is needed to be applicable to our patients in our daily practice here at Vanderbilt. So here we are going to answer the question once and for all, is ketamine helpful? Is it harmful or is it just a whole bunch of hogwash? Now, when the concept of ERAS was formulated over a decade ago, the idea was to just throw the kitchen sink at the patients attack pain from a variety of pain receptors, all of them. And we know that ERAS is effective, but what we don't know is the impact of each individual component to the overall picture. And here's the key that I do not want you to miss. We are doing something radically different that has never been investigated before. Sure, the impact on opioids is gonna be of interest, but in an era where opioid utilization is already strategically minimized, we are going to focus on functional recovery. And one of the most comprehensive ways to quantify recovery is length of stay, as it reflects achievements of the important milestones, such as adequate pain control, uh, function of your bowels, ambulation, et cetera. And our sample size calculation of 85% power to detect a 10% difference in length of stay, which is equivalent to about half a day, which monetarily means a lot for the hospital, we plan to enroll almost 1,200 patients. Keep in mind, folks, the average treatment arm of every past ketamine study in the past has been 50 patients. So Vanderbilt will be performing the largest RCT of perioperative ketamine use to date. This study has been a long time in the making. For the past two years, we have been partnering with the Learning Healthcare System to plan a large scale pragmatic RCT to investigate the impact of perioperative ketamine on enhanced recovery, cleverly titled Impact ERAS. This trial will involve patients undergoing abdominal surgeries on a preset VUMC pathway. And per routine care, these patients are going to receive their usual pre-op blocks, their you know, pre-op medications, Tylenol, Gabapentin, 
And it is at this time that the patients will be consented for enrollment in the trial by a member of our perioperative team. Intraoperatively, patients will be randomized to receive either saline, placebo, or ketamine, which will be given as a bolus and then continued as an infusion postoperatively for 48 hours. Importantly, all the other elements of ERAS will be consistent. With your help, we can conduct this trial and get the answers we are seeking. And we hope that for the sake of science that you will adopt to a couple necessary workflow items. If your patient is on a colorectal, surjonc, or ventral hernia pathway and has consented for enrollment, you will pick up the study drug from the Pixis and PACU rather than the OR pharmacy. And it's this fridge and PACU where the contents will be changed on a randomized cluster basis, and you're going to be blinded to whether it's ketamine or saline control. So practically, what does this look like? You will be alerted to the status of your patient's enrollment as you approach them in pre-op holding. A large yellow sticker or label on their IV fluid will alert you that this patient has consented to participate in our ketamine trial. An alternative color yet to be determined depending on what we find um, is going to signal that the patient has elected to do routine care and has not enrolled in the study. So what does this mean for you? Well, oh, actually, before we talk about that, um, Yellow, you can remember that they have enrolled in the ketamine trial because the sticker of ketamine is yellow, so pretty easy. Um, so what does this mean practically? Well, if they've enrolled in the trial, that means that you must get your ketamine from the Pixis. The refrigerator looks something like the picture to the left. Alternatively, if the patient has elected routine care, meaning that they don't want to receive a saline placebo versus ketamine, they actually want the ketamine, then you have to go to your usual OR pharmacy. Intraoperatively, study patients will not have a ketamine stick to bolus from, as the study drug is contained in, with its entirety within the blinded bag. So this means that instead of giving a bolus stick, you are going to give a bolus followed by an infusion on the Alaris pump. And these Alaris pumps will be programmed for this with an easy one button start. For non-study patients, you're just gonna obtain your normal bolus stick from pharmacy per usual. And no matter the study status, if you suspect pain intraoperatively, simply treat the pain as you normally would for an ERAS pathway, methadone being the preferred first line agent. And in the post-op period, this infusion needs to continue for 48 hours. So you do not need to waste the study drug with pharmacy, just bring it with you to the PACU. The PACU nurse will perform a handoff to document that he or she is now taking possession of the possibly controlled sub substance of the study drug. And for the non-study patients where we know it's ketamine, you will just waste it as normal in the OR pharmacy. So to summarize the three-step changes to your practice, if your patient is enrolled in the study, please obtain the study drug from the refrigerated Pixis in the PACU. Next, bolus off the pump and start the infusion at the induction of anesthesia. Lastly, bring that study infusion with you to PACU instead of wasting it at pharmacy. If you have any questions on the clinical operations, you can come to me, Brian Allen, or Matt McAvoy. If you have questions regarding the periop logistics, Crystal Parrish is our NP lead for the study. This trial is IRB approved and ready to go on a go live date of April 1st this year, just a few couple months away. One of the greatest joys of working in this trial is the opportunity to collaborate with the learning healthcare system who helps bridge that gap between research operations and clinical operations. And this trial would not be possible without their leadership and support, especially our mother hen, Mary Lynn Deere, up in the left corner. I'd also like to personally thank Drs. Sherward, McElroy, and Pontari Pandey for their advisement and guidance in the early stages of this trial. And uh, it's at this point that I am happy to entertain any of your questions. Thank you all so much for your attention.
Brittany, that was uh, absolutely excellent. Looking through the chat, um, uh, I would encourage everyone to look at some of the notes that are there. Dr. Rice has commented on the number of board questions that were uh, covered in this talk, um, as well as some comments from uh, Dr. Pandhar Pandey on uh, systematic reviews and the need for this study. Um, Ron Bell, I believe, uh, asked, if you need a second or additional infusion bag of study medication, where would you get it from? Excellent question. So we have done the math to figure out how much ketamine that we would need because that we do max it out um, on a per kilo basis. So we don't, if your patient is more than 100 kilos, you don't go above the certain dose just like you normally do with ERAS. So we calculated out what would be needed for a surgery that would even last, you know, 12 hours um, and added an additional 48 hours. Right. So the volume that's in that study infusion is enough to last for the entire 48 hours plus surgery. Excellent. Um, Dr. Edwards commented that um, tra the transitional pain service focuses on opioid tapers and pain resolution uh, with reduced incidence of chronic pain. Uh, any thoughts on long-term outcomes here and any confounding from the use of memantine, which I know that sometimes in the perioperative period we use? Great question. Um, so back on the summary slide um, where I did like the take home points, I put a PubMed ID next to the impact on chronic pain. Um, that was a study by Loftus and all, actually I think I might, I didn't include it because I didn't think I was gonna have enough time, but um, most people agree that this is one of the most well done RCTs for opioid tolerant patients. It was done with pain surgery. Um, and they found that overall there was a 37% reduction in opioid consumption, so almost 40%, which corroborates what we talked about. But when they did a subgroup analysis, they found that there was no opioid reduction at all for patients who were not opioid tolerant. And all of the effect was carried by such a magnified reduction when patients were opioid tolerant, meaning that they used, I think, more than 40 milliequivalents of morphine on a daily basis. And interestingly, as a plot twist, they followed up on these patients six weeks post-op and found that there was a 26% reduction in their pain scores. And I forget what it was for their opioid consumption, but it was significantly decreased as well. Um, so I do think that there's a much greater benefit or a much more magnified benefit for opioid tolerant patients. Um, we will be performing a sub analysis with our data to look and see if that effect again is magnified. Um, so great question. I don't know if I answered it. Was that the question I got distracted? I think so, I think so. Um, another question uh, from Dr. Blair uh, says, isn't the use of methadone with its NMD mimetic activity a confounder in a trial of this sort? And before you answer that, I'll throw in an answer offered by Brian Allen, which is studies that have been done with both ketamine and methadone show an independent effect or a benefit of each. So um, I guess the, the Brian answered that somewhat, but what's your thought of why, why would we still use um, methadone rather than necessarily saying recommending fentanyl or Dilaudid? Okay, I have probably three different points to that. I would say first, um, in the, uh, I think two of the meta-analyses that I brought up, a um, subgroup analysis was done for the addition of nitrous oxide, which also works at the NMDA receptor. Um, and they found that there was no difference in results. And so um, not to say it's similar to methadone, but looking at another agent that acts at the NMDA receptor probably does not interfere with the signal of your results. Um, and then second, I would say using methadone as a first line agent, um, the literature uh, is fairly strong for methadone in a total uh, reduction in opioid consumption after surgery. Um, and in fact, there was a new uh, article that is about to be published shortly about the impact of methadone in ERAS specifically. Um, and then lastly, I would say we're doing this as a pragmatic trial. So we want to know what is the impact of ketamine in the whole big picture of ERAS. So as opposed to like laboratory conditions or like ideal conditions where we you know, take out the methadone. We want to know real life practice. If we're using methadone in our ERAS pathways, 
then how does the addition of ketamine play into that? So I'm actually interested in keeping the methadone there because that's what we would do without it anyway. Yeah, and I, th I think that maybe to add on one little bit there is it will actually make it harder for you to show any benefit of the ketamine. Um, and uh, with, uh, with that being um, with methadone's benefit. So I think that's exciting that if we find that there is a benefit to, uh, to ketamine, or we may find that in the mix of everything else, there isn't. Um, Dr. St. Jock asked, uh, said pretty convincing evidence for larger, more painful surgeries, but what about thoughts for more minor, typically outpatient procedures such as thyroid, cystos, IR procedures, et cetera? Great question. Um, so based upon what we have reviewed, if it is a minor procedure where the pain score is expected to be less than four, or the average pain score is around four, ketamine may not give you any additional benefit for consuming less opioids. Um, it will decrease your pain scores, but the, you will probably not get a statistically significant reduction in um, opioid utilization. Um, that being said, I would say the caveats are for patients that are highly sensitive to uh, the effects of opioids, like maybe someone has a really strong history of PONV and you're in an ambulatory setting and you want to avoid opioids altogether. Um, or, you know, let's say they have sleep apnea and you're a little afraid of giving this patient some opioids and then sending them out the door um, and concerned about respiratory depression, ketamine can be a great option for them. Um, or if they're opioid tolerant. Excellent. Um, and then a question that I figured would come up, Dr. Wander says, what do you make of the Maheshwari study from 2020 on spine surgery? Um, we put the link in there for anyone interested. They ran, did a prospective RCT uh, randomizing patients undergoing major spine surgery to a combination of uh, basically multimodals with ketamine, gabapentin, and lidocaine, um, all that were stopped at the end of the surgery or in PACU. Uh, versus opioids, and there was no impact on opioid consumption. So what, what are your thoughts about that trial? I would have to read that paper before I made comments. Um, I would be interested because we define the win as either a reduction in opioids or a reduction in pain, right? If you're able to decrease pain without increasing your opioids, then that would be a positive signal and a win. Was there a secondary outcome looking at pain scores? I'm not familiar with that one. No, it's a, it's really interesting. There's a, been a lot of debate about it because it was uh, methodologically well performed um, from an RCT perspective. It included um, a uh, a number of the multimodals we commonly use. Um, Sixty to seventy percent of the patients in both groups were chronic opioid users, and the dose that they used. Um, in major spine surgery for chronic opioid users, it, it was half of what had been shown in the past to be a benefit. In the past 10 mics per kg per minute had shown to be a benefit and they used five. Um, they were stopped in the PACU, which to your point earlier, it's the prolonged infusions that seem to have the benefit. Um, the lidocaine dose that they used was lower uh, than what we use and the duration before. So I think it, it definitely showed that um, multimodal use at uh, lower doses and shorter durations aren't of benefit. And so I think the idea of the question still out there of what's the right dose and the right duration. And I definitely think it brings up the point that uh, patients presenting for spine surgery who are chronic opioid users um, that's a, that's a different subset, even back to Paul's question about you have minor outpatient procedures and then you've got, you know, abdominal orthopedic, et cetera. And then when you have the chronic opioid patient presenting for spine surgery, um, that these things aren't one size fits all. And so, um, I would say that it definitely showed that short infusions at, at lower, uh, doses that have been used previously aren't of benefit. And too, and, I think part of what is so important at looking at the impact of ketamine in ERAS specifically when you're using multimodal and you're attempting to decrease your amount of opioids anyway from the get-go, the signal of opioid reduction is going to be less. And so that's why we're more interested on functional recovery in this setting as opposed to the consumption of opioids too. Um, 
And in case everyone's not following, uh, Dr. Blair asked the question, is this study going to include spine patients? It is not. We are right. sticking with major abdominal surgery for now. And I think that's an important thing. Uh, back to Pratik's comment about the heterogeneity in a lot of these systematic reviews is while all abdominal surgery isn't the same, we tried to pick things that were closer to one another rather than including um, types of surgeries that we, we think may have uh, very different sort of uh, nociceptive effects. Um, all right, well, we have two minutes left. If anybody wants to unmute and ask a question or fire something else away in the chat, um, that would be great. What I would say is I know <clears throat> since we launched with Enhanced Recovery uh, Pathways in 2014, there's been a lot of um, legitimate questions and concerns about, hey, even if this works, what part works, what doesn't? And I think the really unique thing here, and um, I believe we have uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Todd Rice on the call, who um, is in uh, pulmonary critical care medicine here and also one of the leaders in learning healthcare system, what we've really done is, is try to work with them to set up a research platform. So, and he could maybe make a brief comment, but the idea is if we figure out this answer, we could then take lidocaine and do this, or we could take gabapentin with all the recent news about it and do this. And so the idea is we can set something up where we can be a place to Brittany's point of doing a trial that is you know, nearly uh, 15 times bigger than, than some of the largest trials that have been done. And so, um, so we're, we're grateful that to have the learning healthcare system helping us work on a research platform. And Todd, I don't know if you have any comment there. Uh, I don't, I, I think the only comment is exactly what you said is, is our goal in collaborating with a number of groups like you all is to try and help set up the infrastructure that would then allow you to test multiple things in this same infrastructure. When you go to add something else, it's always a little bit of a tweak and a little bit different, but not very much. And, you know, like you said, that would then allow you to test gabapentin and lidocaine and, you know, you can just name them. Excellent. Well, um, and last one, uh, Ron says, is bariatric surgery included because surgeons are asking to turn off the ketamine during the surgery? Nope, no bariatrics. We're sticking to colorectal surgical oncology and um, large ventral hernias because we are looking at the study drug for 48 hours. So we're being selective about taking the patients that have a longer inpatient stay. Good question. Excellent. Well, it is 7.30. That was a action-packed hour, Brittany. That was absolutely terrific. Um, we will look forward to uh, seeing everyone next week and uh, feel free to email um, Brittany, Brian Allen, or myself if you have questions um, about her study. So thank you so much. Y'all have a great day. Thank you.